أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وألا أهل بيتك المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مذنوم يا عدشان كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم ولا من من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ذلك ومن يعظم شعائر الله فإنها من تقوى القلوب أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على As we know, the first of Muharram is a day whereby we begin to commemorate the tragedy of the grandson of the Messenger of God, Sayyid al-Shahada, Abi Abdullah al-Hussein, alayhi salatu wassalam, and numerous examples from the lives of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, point to entering into the state of grief that we enter into on this night. It is said that one day a man, he enters into the company of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim, the seventh Imam, and he sees the Imam in a state of grief. He sees him not eating, not drinking, and he's in tears, to which the Imam alayhi salam is asked by this companion of his, O grandson of the Messenger of God, why do I see you in this state? To which he responds, do you not know that tonight is the night of the first of Muharram? And only days from today, we recollect the day whereby our grandfather Hussein alayhi salam was slaughtered in the same way that people would slaughter a sheep. Or that famous incident when Rayyan ibn Shabib enters into the company of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada alayhi salam. And the Imam alayhi salam, in that state of grief that he was in on this first night of Muharram, he tells him, "In kunta baki an ala shay, fa abki al Hussein alayhi salam." That if you wish to weep over something, then weep over Hussein alayhi salam. That son of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa ala, who the Prophet of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, would pick him up at a very young age, and he would ride him on his back across the streets and across the city of Medina. One day a man, he comes to the Messenger of God with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on his shoulders. And he looks at the Imam, who's maybe three, four years old. And he says, Oh Hussein, you're really lucky to be riding on the shoulders of this man, meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. To which the Messenger of God alayhi salam responds to this companion of his. He says, no. He said, this man, is lucky to have this rider on his back. We're not talking about any sad story filled with tragedy, with the detail and the nuance that we narrate it. Not like a novel or not like a really great film, but we're talking about a man who embodied and emphasized all of the most perfect and pure and sublime qualities that was emanated and illuminated by the Messenger of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which is why he himself, with his own sacred and blessed tongue, he says, Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. That Husayn is from me and I am from Husayn. Husayn is from me is obvious. He's my child, he's my grandson. Wa ana min Husayn. But I am from Hussein. Our intellects don't have the capacity to understand what that means. 
And then he, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, continues and he says, Ahabba Allah man, Ahabba Husayna. That surely God loves the one who loves Husayn. Also from that sacred tongue of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he states, Hassani wal Husayn, Sayyida, Shabab Ahl Jannah. That these two sons of mine, Hassan and Hussein, they are the leaders of the youth of paradise. Merit after merit, fada'il after fada'il to the son of the daughter of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This is who is Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib ibn Salamullah alayhi. For those of us who know, we know. For those of us who have an awareness of the tragedy and this episode and this anecdote, year after year, generation after generation, we recollect this story knowing exactly what it is that we're going to utter. We know the details from the beginning to the end without any lapse. Yet unlike any and every other story, this Emphasis on grief still burns the heart in the same way as the first time that we heard it. And truly, there's something sacred about it. Because like we know, and like we'll tell in just a moment, or in a few moments, that the first one to cry over this tragedy is of course the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, at the birth of his son Hussein, sallallahu alayhi so through our remembrance and through our showing of grief via the clothes that we wear or the tears that we shed or whatever effort that we put forth in remembrance and in recollection of the tragedy of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, at the very least is walking in the sunnah of the greatest of God's creations, our messenger Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa ala. But at the same time, it's important for us to understand that our clothes or our tears or our recitation of poetry or our recollection of eulogy or whatever it is that we perform in terms of ritual has a means toward undertaking something far deeper and something far greater. It's not such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet of God sallallahu alayhi wa ala, and the divine laws that have been prescribed to us as believers in order to find Him subhanahu wa ta'ala have been instituted solely that we perform acts of repetition. Repetition is good. If there's any teachers in the room, any instructors, you know that one of the best ways to get your students to know or understand something is to get them to repeat it. To repeat it time and time and time and time again such that they understand exactly what that particular equation is, what that word is, what that is, whatever it might be. But repetition only takes you so far in terms of intellectual knowledge. What we want to do is aspire towards something greater, and that is not any manifestation of ilm or knowledge, but what is known as ma'rifa of Allah Azza wa Jal. This deep knowledge, not only limited to our rationales or our intellect, but that knowledge that stems from the heart. And that's not only cultivated with repetition, it's cultivated with repetition plus reformation. And through the remembrance and the consistent retelling of the story of Sayyid al-Shuhada al-Husayn alayhi salam, what we seek to do is reform these hearts, reform these souls, and reach the ultimate potential of human perfection that walks in the footsteps of Hussein and his grandfather Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And for today's discussion, insha'Allah ta'ala, I want to reflect upon how we can utilize these rituals in remembrance of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wa salam toward reaching the state that we're hoping and that we're aspiring to. And also I want to reflect upon, insha'Allah, what it means when we state that we truly identify as a Shi'i community via these rituals 
that we utilize to commemorating the tragedy of Imam al Hussein. So, for today's discussion, inshallah, which I have titled Social Identity, the Social Identity of Ashura, I want to reflect upon this notion in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding what it means when we state social identity. What is, it, what is a social identity in the first place? Secondly, how Ashura and Karbara rituals that we perform during the course of these days of Muharram have become a manifestation of our social identity. And thirdly and finally, how we can utilize our social identity to transform and to transcend toward reaching a higher of height. So let's jump into dimension number one of this discussion. What is a social identity in the first place? The word identity these days is often thrown around in a wide variety of different circles. And across various different academic disciplines, you'll always study this notion of identity via, again, various different lenses. In general, identity has been defined as the way or the means that an individual chooses to describe themselves. Let me put it in perspective for you for just a moment. If I want to identify myself by certain factors, I would tell you that I am chaplain at New York University. I am professor, I am sheikh, I am father to my two daughters, I am husband to my wife, I am son to my parents, I am depressed Knicks fan, I am coffee lover. I am all of these various identities, and if I ask anyone in the room to explain themselves via their identities, you can come up with a wide variety of different lists, right? Depending on the circumstances and who you're introducing yourself to, you would also identify yourself differently. I'm going to identify myself differently with you all than the way that I would identify myself, for instance, if I was walking into a job interview, right? We talk about the skills that you have and so on and so forth. But in addition to this, there is a theory called social identity theory that suggests that individuals don't only identify themselves by who they are as individuals, but they also identify themselves via a group identity. Everyone following for just a moment? So for instance, we also identify ourselves by what groups that we are in, what gender we're in, what, 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 what faith that we subscribe to, uh, where, where we are on the socioeconomic class, for instance, what race or ethnicity we are. And oftentimes, those social identities or those larger group identities that we identify or associate ourselves with are oftentimes closer to us than who we are as individuals. Again, according to the social identity theory. So let me give you an example. If someone were to ask you in this gathering who you are with all of your valor and all of your vigor and all of the intensity that you have to being in the majlis of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, what is someone going to say? I'm Shia. <laughs> I'm here for Imam al Hussein. I'm Husseini. I'm the lover of the Prophet and his family. Who cares about my name? Who cares about my father? Who cares about my... I'm this? Why? Because we realize that in certain gatherings and in certain moments, on the basis of our emotion, we are often drawn towards subscribing toward our group identity more so than we identify with our personal identity. Let me give you another example to sort of drive the point home. Like I mentioned before, and like I'll probably be mentioning a whole lot of times over the next couple of days, I'm a really, really big Knicks fan. The Knicks suck, right? They're terrible, they're awful, but every single time that I identify myself with my favorite basketball team, what do I say, or what do we say? We say, we're Knicks fans, and we are gonna win the championship this year, right? Why do we say we? My mom, dad always used to ask me this when we were kids, why are you saying we? Right? Anyone else know what I'm talking about? Why do you say we? You're not winning anything. You're not, you're not playing. But we identify so closely with that social identity, that social group, that it becomes a part of who we are at certain junctures during the course of our life. Everyone following so far? Along with this notion of social identity theory, theorists, they suggest that individuals who subscribe to these group identities, there are also symbols that they associate with their identity. Let me give you an example. A sports fan is going to say, I am a fan of this team. 
But along with being a fan of that team, they automatically identify with certain symbols, the logo of their team, the jersey, right? So on and so forth. For instance, those of you all in finance, right? You identify with wearing Patagonia vests even when it's 100 degrees outside, right? Who knows what I'm talking about? You guys know what I'm talking about. Someone would state, for instance, that students at New York University, they dress a certain way or they talk a certain way, right? Millennials, they're always on their phone, on TikTok, taking selfies of them. I don't know what, right? There are certain identities or symbols that are married to those identities in order for us to understand exactly what are the common behaviors or patterns of those individuals. Am I losing you all? Is this interesting? Great. And in the 1960s, there was a Polish scholar, a man by the name of Henry Tajfel. And he is the first one to present his notion or his definition of social identity theory. And he states that it is formulated on three different phases. Phase number one, he states, is what is known as categorization. An individual, when they walk into a room or when they walk into a new space, or a child when they walk into classroom the first day, or if it's your first time walking to the Islamic Center at NYU today, automatically, subconsciously, you're going to start to categorize people based on your perceptions and based on the baggage that you have. You're going to start to understand that certain people hang around with certain people. Or a child who walks into a classroom on their very first day of school, they're going to start to understand that they themselves are looking for a place to fit in. And subconsciously, they're going to see different groups of kids sitting with one another, playing with different types of toys, sitting in different, si in different circles, speaking about different things while they're trying to figure out for themselves exactly which category they should fit into on their own. The second phase of Henry Tajfel's social identity theory is what is known as identification. When the individual themselves, they realize who and what and where they want to be a part of at this moment. I'm sure you all heard about the theory of the sense of belonging. Human beings, they desire a sense of belonging to be in community, to have social interaction with one another. It's also included in one of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? He talks about this notion and this desire that human beings naturally have to belong. So Tajfel, he states, that the second stage of social identity theory then is where the individual figures out where she or he wants to be situated in that group. Do I want to sit with these people? No, they don't look like me. They don't have the same interests as me. They have a different skin color than me. They identify with different things than me. And we are often drawn toward people who we have more similarities to. Following? And then the third stage of his identity theory states that this cultivates a notion of an us versus them, right? And this is debatable, but nonetheless, he states that once we find the group and the ident or the social identity group that we want to situate ourselves in, we begin to have a lot of pride in that. We begin to feel validated, right? If you're sitting with a bunch of other people in finance wearing Patagonia vests when it's 115 degrees outside, the other one is wearing it, you're wearing it, you're all sweating, but you're saying, you know what, you're sweating and I'm sweating, so you know what, these other guys who are not wearing these really hot vests at this very moment, they don't get it, right? Because it's us versus them, and they don't understand who we are, right? Anyone know what I'm talking about? We often create these validations on the basis of what social identity that we come from. And this also, on a negative side, also has a lot of positives to it. We find comfort. We find belonging. We have similarities with people who have a lot of other similarities with us. And when you take a look at an individual, again, you're going to find this manifest itself in various unique ways throughout the course of our lifetimes. Let me give you a couple of examples. You walk into the gathering here today, and you're looking for the place where we're hosting the Mejlis. This is a university, so you're going to find people of various different backgrounds utilizing and walking through the hallways and accessing the space. The minute that you see someone decked out in all black from head to toe, you know they're here for Majlis for Muhammad Hussein alayhi So you're more likely to go to them and say, hey, are you here for the Majlis? Where's the Majlis at? Where's dinner at? Where's whatever at? Because you know 
on the basis of what they're wearing, that they more likely than not subscribe to the same social identity group as you do, and it offers us a sense of validation. Obvious, right? Or something that I still fail to understand every single time that I'm with my family, that every single time my wife sees another woman in hijab, they say, Salaamu Alaikum, as if they've seen each other or known each other for the last 20 years. I said, do you know her? Why are you saying salam to her? She's like, oh no, we're both wearing hijab. We just said salam. We had like some connection with one another. I don't understand it necessarily because every single, t you know, but nonetheless, again, because these two individuals identify with the same social identity, there's a unique connection and sort of magnetic pull between those two individuals. And reoccurring throughout the course of our lifetime, this is a common pattern that every human being encounters and endures. And so when we come, for instance, to the majlis of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, everyone knows what they're here for. They're here to grieve. They're here to weep. They're here to offer consolation to the greatest of God's creations, the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam. And this brings me then toward the second dimension of my conversation for this evening. And that is, what is the relationship between social identity and Imam al Hussein or and Ashura? Now, bear with me for just a moment. Many of you know that over the last couple of months, I recently completed my doctoral dissertation. And my research, thank you, and my research was studying Shia Muslim youth in the United States and their identity development, hence all the terminologies. And in my research and in my interviews of a wide array of different students and different young people between an age demographic, age demographic of 17 and 22, there was a common pattern amongst Shia youth. And that is that every single one of them mentioned to me about how much they love the majlis of Imam al-Hussein or how much they identify with the majlis of Imam al-Hussein as a pride or as a marriage or as a link between them and their Shi'i belief. Naturally, anyone who knows, like I said before, they know. It's something that we grow up with, that we learn from a very young age. I think before my children, they knew how to say mama and baba, they knew how to say ya Hussein, right? Why? Because it's something that we teach for a whole host of different reasons, which we're going to get to in just a moment. And even though these youth who come from a wide variety of different backgrounds, very diverse, I found this on the web. What they all subscribed to, again, was the fact that they were Shia and that they love Imam al Hussein, alayhi salatu wasalam, but many of them also stated, for instance, but I'm not particularly religious. Now, I want you to go back internally within yourself for just a moment and your own interactions with people in your family and in your community and in your social circles. How many people, for instance, they identify themselves with being Shia, or they come to the mosque and they come to the majlis during the days of Muharram and commemorate the tragedy of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, but they're like prayers, not for me. Fasting, not for me. And again, I'm not here to say you're not welcome in the majlis, not at all, that's not what I'm trying to say at all. What I'm trying to say is that let's utilize these days as a stepping stone for our spiritual growth as well. And that the reason why so many of us identify with being Shia even more so than we identify with being Muslim as a social identity label is because social identities more often than not are sort of surrounded or entered into by a minoritized experience, right? So if I were to ask a white man in America, how would you identify yourself? More likely than not, they're going to say, I identify myself by being a white man. But if I were to ask a black man, a black woman in America, how would you identify yourself? More likely than not, they would say, I identify myself by being black amongst their other social identities. If I ask people in a wide, large classroom of mine, and I've done this numerous times, and I ask them, how would you identify yourself? Everyone who has any minoritized religion would identify by their religion, except for someone who is a Protestant or a Christian in this country. Maybe in other settings, that would be very different. Why? Because again, we tend to identify with things that we are minoritized by. And that's normal and that's natural. And again, we identify ourselves as being Shia Muslims for the same reason. 
And the sign or the symbol for most of us of being a Shia Muslim is through our upholding of the majlis for Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. Someone says this is a problem, no? Not necessarily. There's two main factors or contributing factors to why exactly we hold these rituals to such a high value. If you're following what I'm saying, you're not falling asleep, recite one salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The first factor of why we tend to be so close toward these rituals that we perform in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam is, of course, our history. When you take a look at the earliest days and the earliest Muslim communities from the first and second century, there was such a stronghold in making every effort by the political and leading authorities to restricting the majadis of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. During the time of the Umayyads, every single effort was made to prohibit individuals to go to Karbala, for instance, to perform the ziyara of Sayyid al Shahada. Anyone who was known to recite poetry in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam would be imprisoned, would be jailed, would be killed. During the time of the Abbasids, not only once, not only twice, not only three times, but upwards of 13 times was the grave site of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam destroyed by the Abbasid authorities in order to restrict the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam to reaching the grave site of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. Every single effort was made in order to eradicate the remembrance of the grandson of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how did the early Muslim community respond? By sleeping? By sitting down? No. They followed in the legacy of Lady Zainab Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who stands in front of Yazid ibn Muawiyah in her famous sermon that she utters in his company in Damascus. And she says, Wallahi la Wallahi lan tamuhu bikrana. That no matter what, no matter what effort that you make, and no matter what plot that you scheme, and no matter if it takes till the very last inch of your life, O oh Yazid, you and all of those who follow in your legacy, you'll never be able to wipe away our remembrance. Allah. And thus, through the advice and through the encouragement of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, every single effort was made in order to encourage the followers of Ahlul Bayt to remember Hussein, to weep for Hussein, to grieve for Hussein, to go and visit Hussein, and to make it the biggest deal so that no one forgets. Which is why we do what it is that we do. Someone says, why don't we grieve for the Prophet والسلام, this way when he died? And again, there are factors historically that I'm mentioning that contribute to this. And like we said before, this is also the sunnah of the Messenger of God. So again, don't treat this as something insignificant. This is something sacred. Right now, we have the freedom and the flexibility to gather in the way that we do. But like we know over the last couple of years, we didn't have that potential and that capacity. And there are people less like us in different parts of the world today who are unable to do it freely. So they gather together secretly. And many of them who gather together secretly are also in prison and are also killed for doing what? Nothing other than remembering the legacy of the family of the Messenger of God. So the first reason why these rituals and the day of Ashura is so intrinsic to our social identity as being followers of Ahlul Bayt is because of the various historical circumstances that encourage this by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu This is number one. Secondly, number two, is because of the emotional tie that is naturally linked with the remembrance of Imam al Hussein and the tragedy of Karbala and Abi Abdullah sallallahu alayhi Let me give you an example or put this in perspective for you for just a moment. Oftentimes, the most engaging speaker or leader is someone who is 
the most charismatic, and oftentimes the most emotional. We look for people like that because it draws a point home into our hearts. In addition, when we have our heart into something, it means that we're going to be putting forth all of our effort into completing that task or into reaching that goal. But what does it really mean when we say we put our heart into it? You're putting all your emotion into it. You're putting all of your being into it. And there are certain moments during the course of our lives that we feel most connected to God or most connected to other individuals. And oftentimes those moments are those moments which were filled with the most emotion. Like we were talking about some of us a little while ago. In our past ziyara to Imam al Hussein this past year in December, we had a really emotional moment that some of myself and my friends who made ziyara with us were reflecting upon and remembering and that if you were there, you understood exactly what that moment meant. But if you weren't there, you won't know because of the intensity of the emotion that was had at that given moment. You remember Muharram. You remember Layal al-Qadr and the month of Ramadan more so than you remember other days. Why? Because your emotion is at a higher station during the course of these nights and days. And because of the epic tragedy and martyrdom of Sayyid al-Shahada al-Hussein, salam Allah alayhi, Again, that emotional link that we have to it automatically is connected to our identity and how we define ourselves as believers. And we know this is not something unique. For in the words of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam himself, he states, إِنَّ لِقَتَلَ الْحُسَيْنِ هَرَارَةً فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَا تَبْرُدُوا أَبَدًا he says, surely in the killing of Hussein alayhi salam, the words of the Prophet of God, sallallahu alayhi wa ala, there is a fire that burns in the heart of the believer that never subsides. And that this remembrance and this retelling and this recollection, again, has then become a part of our identity, a part of who we are, more so as a social group than who we are even as individuals. Because on the day of Ashura, we're told to not go to work, to not go to school, to not worry about anything. On the day of Ashura, when you remember the tragedy of Imam al Hussein, we're not concerned about who we are as individuals for that one day. The only identity that we subscribe to on that day is being someone who loves the Prophet of God. And if this is a day of grief for the Prophet of God, then it's a day of grief for me. Right? And on the days in which we recollect this tragedy like we know from various ahadith of Ahlul Bayt the believers are those who are in a state of grief when we are in a state of grief. Huznun li huznina. As the hadith states, the believers are those who are in a state of grief when we are in a state of grief. Ahlul Bayt So our parallel and our barometer and our potential and who we craft as a role model is only them. That brings me then toward this third dimension. If we've understood then what it means to be part of a social identity, and secondly, we understand why these rituals are tied to our social identity as followers of Ahlul Bayt, the third dimension or the third question that we need to ask then is how can we transcend beyond these rituals and these remembrances solely as this identifying factor for who we are as believers and reach the goal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have set out for us to reach. In other words, like I said before, in these interviews and these conversations that I've had with a wide variety of different individuals, a consistent theme was brought forth. And in fact, across these formal interviews that I performed, the word God was far and away so distant from the discussion of what it meant to being a Shia for so many of these young individuals that it made me wonder, where is God in their life? Is God in their life? And to me, it was a bit problematic. That how can we emphasize ritual? How can we enter emphasize the social identity that we subscribe to 
without any remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I just want to say this in parenthesis. This is not some internal attack on our Shi'i communities or something like that. No. If you go ahead and take a look at various surveys conducted uh, amongst Muslims more broadly post 9-11, we identify with, many young people identify with being a Muslim as their social identity group more so than their identification with faith, meaning they see Muslim or Islam as some sort of social revolutionary stance against the injustices that they're experiencing in their country, particularly post 9-11, in light of police surveillance, and so on and so forth. So it's a common trend and a common thread amongst Muslims more broadly, in light of the circumstances that we live in. But when I try to drive this point home for just a moment, let me sort of reflect upon it a little bit longer in order that you get the point. Because of how important that the Majlis of Imam al Hussein has become, or has always been, and how easy now for many of, us, many of us it is toward reaching the ziyara of Imam al Hussein in Karbara, we often see the Majlis of Hussein, the ziyara of Hussein, the tear that we shed for Imam al Hussein, as the ends as opposed to the means. You follow what I'm saying? Let me give you an example. How many of you have heard hadiths from the Prophet of God or from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, from individuals who dress like me, sitting on a chair just like this one, maybe a little bit more comfortable, and say that the one who sheds one tear for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in grief, that one tear extinguishes the fires of hell. How many of you have heard it before? These are hadith from Ahlul Bayt. I'm not mocking it. A hadith, for instance, that says that the one who visits Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam on this day, they get X and Y and Z reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reward, when you look at it, you're like, whoa, dude, are you serious? This is the reward we get for Ziyar Imam al Hussein? Sign me up. The one who does this for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in his remembrance, they get this. The one who does this for Imam al Hussein, the one who recites one line of poetry in honor of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him or her a home in paradise. It's a hadith from Imam al Sadiq. The one who recites one line of poetry and causes 40 people to cry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant them paradise. Then the Imam says, No. The one who recites one line of poetry and causes 30 people to cry, Allah will grant him paradise. He says, no, 20 people, no, 10 people, no, one person. And then the Imam says, no. He said, if one individual recites one line of poetry and one person within that audience tries to weep over the tragedy of Hussein alayhi salam, then everyone in that congregation is granted paradise. The reward is immense for these rituals that we perform. But what happens for many people is they forget that when they read these lines of hadith or when they hear them from the podium, they immediately internalize them and they feel, well, I shed that one tear, I recited that one line, I tried to cry, I visited Hussein, I loved the Prophet of God, I recited his salawat. Prayers? Now I'm good. Fasting? Now I'm good. I'll get it with Hussein in paradise. I'll be with his grandfather, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa No, that's not how it works. There's a prerequisite toward the reward in the first place. The prerequisite is to be one who loves them. To be one who loves the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is to be one who prays. To be one who loves his daughter, Fatima alayhi salam, is one who fasts. To be one who loves Ali sallallahu alayhi is one who worships and supplicates like Ali did. One who loves Hassan and Hussein alayhi salam, they're ready for trial, they're ready for tribulation, they're patient, they're generous, they have all of their qualities. And once we've emphasized, illuminated, manifested all of those qualities, then when we visit Hussein alayhi salam, we've visited Hussein. Because all of the hadith don't just say the one who visits Hussein, they get this reward. It says, Man zara al Hussein, arifan bihaqqa. The one who visits Hussein, knowing his station. We don't know a station by hearing an anecdote. We know a station by knowing who he is in the eyes of God, who he is in the eyes of the Prophet. What it meant when the Prophet ﷺ tells that companion of his that 
Rather, I am the lucky one to have this Hussein on my back. My dear friends, Ashura, Kerbera, these majalis are meant to allow for us to become whole. They're meant for us to become free. They're meant for us to break from the shackles of ignorance and from all of the distractions of this dunya that we're so consumed by. From Hussein alayhi salam, we learn what it means to be a human being. And from every one of the anecdotes that we recite during the course of these nights, we learn a unique lesson about what it means to being a human being truly the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. Let me give you a few examples. On the 10th of Muharram, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam has lost every single one of his companions, every single one of his family members. And his horse enters into the river Euphrates. You know, for those of you who are familiar with the story, just how thirsty the grandson and the messenger of God was on that day. And Omar bin Sa'ad, he makes out a call. And he says, Hussein drinks water while we loot his women and his children. Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam drops the water that he was about to drink. And he utters this line, he says, Ya Shi'at al Abi Sufyan, in lam yakun lakum deen, wala takhafun al ma'ad, fakunu ahraran fi dunyakum. He says, O followers of Abba Sufyan, if you do not believe in religion, you don't have any morality that you would abuse women and children, then at the very least be free in this world. Be a human being. From the day of Ashura, we learn humanity from Al-Abbas. When he himself approaches the river Euphrates, he realizes and he teaches us what it means to be altruistic. He looks down at that water and he states, Ya nafs min ba'dil Hussein hu. As he looks at that water, he says, O soul, how can I drink when my brother Hussein is thirsty? On the day of Ashura, we learn humanity from Hur Riyahi, who says, Inni ara nafsi bayna jannati wan nar, as we'll narrate in a couple of nights. He says, Surely I see myself between the gardens of paradise and the fires of hell, and by God, I will not choose anything but paradise and the company of the grandson of the messenger of God. One by one, we learn what it means to being a human being from these personalities. And that through these remembrances, and through these rituals, and through these tears, and through this grieving, and through every effort of exhaustion that we feel as the nights get closer and closer to the 10th of Muharram, allow for our, your heart to be reformed and to be filled with those most perfect of values and virtues and qualities. And remember that there's something bigger than the ritual. There's something far greater that we're meant to aspire to, which is why it's been emphasized time and time and time again from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wassalam. My dear friends, we know that tonight is the night of the first of Muharram. We mentioned before that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, one by one, they taught us how to demonstrate grief during the course of these nights. And just before I get there, let me just narrate to you this one tradition. It is said that after the Battle of Siffin, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam was with a group of his companions as they were returning from Siffin back toward Kufa. And as they were riding back, they reached a land known as Nainavah. Nainavah is one of the names of Karbara. And at this moment, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he looks at his companions and he says, what's the name of this territory? What's the name of this region? At this moment, he says, Nainama, his companion. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he looks toward his son, Aba Abdullah, and he says, Ispir, ya Aba Abdullah. He says, be patient, O Hussein. 
Imam al Hussein says, Oh my father, why should I be patient? And all of the companions around Imam Ali, they surrounded the commander of the faithful to listen to what he had to say to his son about Abdullah. He says, I remember that day when I was in the company of my brother, the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. I entered into his company when Hussein was just a small child. And I saw him in a state of grief. I saw him in a state of tears. And I said, oh, Messenger of God, did someone bother you? Did someone harm you? Did someone say something to you? I'm here. What can I do for you, oh, Rasulullah? To which he says, no, nothing. I'm okay. He says, oh, my brother, Rasulullah, please tell me. What has hurt your heart to the extent that I see you in tears? To which he says, oh, Ali, he says, Jibra'il just descended from the heavens. And he came to my company and he informed me about what is going to happen to my son Hussein. Who was the first to cry for Hussein? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And I asked him, what is going to happen? And he says, and he said, O oh Rasulullah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed me to inform you that your son Hussein alayhi salam will die thirsty, slaughtered in the land known as Nainawa, the land of Karbala. And then Jibra'il, he asked me, he said, Oh Rasulullah, do you wish to see the sand of that land that your son Hussein will be martyred upon? He says, yes. So it is said that Jibra'il returned back with some of the soil from the land of Karbala. How many of you wish to be in Karbala today? Next to Imam al Hussein, salam Allah alayhi. It is said that the Prophet of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he received the sacred sand of Karbala in his hand. And he brought it close to his nose and he smelt the fragrance of the land of Karbara, which only after 50 years, my dear friends, 50 years between the day whereby the Prophet of God وسلم, was buried into the ground, that that same sand was mixed with the blood of the son of the Messenger of God. My dear friends, let me just leave you with this. If you have children in your family, you have small kids, you yourself remember when you had a sibling that was born into the house, how much excitement is in the home? How much happiness is filled into the household when a new child enters into that home? Except the household of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi Wasallam. For when Imam al Hussein Alayhi salam was born into the world, it coincided with the foretelling of that which will happen to his son, Imam al Hussein Sallallahu Alaihi to which when Fatima, peace and blessings be upon her, she sees her father, Rasulullah, in that state of grief. She says, oh my father, why are you grieving? We've just entered into a new phase in our life. There's a child that has been born into the family. Do you not love Hussein? Is everything okay? To which at this moment, Rasulullah says, oh my daughter, Fatima, of course I love Hussein, but I'm grieving for the fact that he will be left alone with 30,000 individuals with swords and with spears and with arrows and with rocks all coming closer and closer and closer toward him on the 10th of Muharram, on the day of Ashura. Ala la'anatullah, ala al-qawm al-zalimin. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'un. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day, on this night of the 1st of Muharram, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the grief in our hearts and the tears in our eyes to allow for us to be amongst those who walk in the footsteps of Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clean and purify our hearts by our love for Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and to grant us a life that resembles the life of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and to grant us a death that resembles the death of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and to never separate us from Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad in this life and in the barzakh and in the next life. Allahumma jal mahiya imahiya Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad وَمَمَاتِي مَمَاتَ مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ وَلَا تَفَرَقْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ صلواتك عليهم أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآله الطاهرين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد